remember the conversation so clearly. My colleague and I, Chris Elder, are talking to Mr. Jolingana, who is a senior manager in the Economic Development Department in the Eastern Cape. The telephone line is terrible. We are leaning into the speakerphone, and it's all we can hear is Rice Krispies that snap, crackle, and pop. And I can hear I'm getting slightly hysterical. And I'm saying, but it's impossible. It's in five days' time. And down the line comes this voice that says, trust. It will all be fine. And literally, five days later, there we are in Umtata delivering our first consultation session for the social economy policy. We are a small team of people working to develop a policy for the social economy in South Africa. We come from a number of different organizations, from economic development, from the International Labour Organization, from the IDC, and from Flanders. But what has been profound for us is the process of asking and hearing what people want from the policy itself. And so we've spent the last few months since Umtata traveling the country, talking to people about what the social economy should look like in our country. We've spoken to over 760 people, people at the heart of the social economy, delivering childhood development services, feeding schemes in schools, running sewing circles, people working at the very heart of where they live and who they are. I believe that the lessons that we have from our travels are important to all of us, all of us as policymakers, for us as activists and practitioners, as social entrepreneurs. But most importantly, I believe it's important for us as people, people in our communities and people in our countries, as we try to build an inclusive economy. So the first thing I'd like to share today is actually the easiest question to answer. It's a great place to start. Is, well, why is the social economy so important? The social economy, I believe, is the quickest mechanism that we currently have to deliver our goal to achieving an inclusive economy. An economy where everybody has equal access to opportunity. An economy where everybody is able to realize their potential. An economy where we have a balanced and respectful relationship with our environment. We now know that the current measure of poverty is completely inadequate. Poverty is not a fixed line that people live above or below of, nor is it a dollar number. And because of this, we know that economic growth is not sufficient to eliminate poverty, nor is it sufficient for us to achieve an inclusive society. And so we look to the social economy as one of the existing mechanisms that we have that can help us to take those steps to get there. But what on earth is it? Well, the social economy is best described on the spectrum. I appreciate that our society is not linear and life is not a straight line, but this shows well, even if it is very simplistic, the interaction between two critical pillars in our society, for-profit organizations and not-for-profit organizations. For-profit organizations exist to generate economic value, largely experienced through profit maximization, you know, shared with shareholders and risk takers and innovators. But on the other side of the spectrum, and it often feels like they're quite far, far away, are the social organizations, the organizations that exist specifically to deliver social value. We used to think that the space in the middle was a bit of a wasteland, but it is thanks to our travels that we've been able to color in this picture. We now know that the social economy represents all organizations that exist specifically to deliver social good, public good. This is an incredible range of organizations, from cooperatives to stock fells and saving schemes to nonprofits and charities, and importantly, those social enterprises. Social enterprises, we now know, instead of moving along the spectrum, hold a very particular space here in the middle. They hold the center. And this is because they act as a bridge. The social enterprise is particularly powerful because it takes the best that business has to offer 
its focus on profit, its ability to earn an income, and it blends that with the best that the social organizations have. They have very specific focus on social change, their ability to take a long-term view, and that's very unique characteristic to operate in very deep complexity. By bringing these two together, the social enterprise is almost acting as a gravitational force. It's pulling the opposite ends of the spectrum together. And because of this, I really believe it is one of the most, the strongest mechanisms and models that we have if we truly want to achieve inclusivity. And we hear this change. We hear the change of this, these two opposite sides coming together in everyday conversations. The financiers are talking impact. The investors talk about social returns and environmental returns. And on the other side, we hear the social leaders talking profit. These are quite powerful and quite profound changes that we are seeing in our societies. So if we recognize the value of the social economy, how exactly does it function? So I would like to share with you two very, very, very dry statistics that we gathered along the way. The first is on bank accounts. I did say these are dry statistics. 84% of people in the social economy have access to bank accounts. They are, their organizations are banked. And on the other side, we see that 17% of people have access to a lawyer. Put together, these two statistics start to show us something quite interesting. The first is, is that the social economy folk choose where and when and how they want to engage in the system. They choose to engage in the financial system. They're banked. But they're not choosing to engage in the legal system. This is particularly intriguing because the legal and regulatory system is the glue of our day-to-day -day business. It's what holds and binds our businesses together. To set up a business, you start a legal entity. If you want to finalize agreements, you sign those contracts. You arbitrate disputes in courts. If the social economy is not using the legal system as its glue, well, then what's holding it together? And those words of Mr. Jolangana come back to us so clearly, so, so clearly. Trust is the glue that holds the social economy together. Trust. 97%, 93% of the people that we spoke to said trust is essential. It is essential to the functioning of their organization. Without it, their organizations would fail. I find this fascinating because I believe that in South Africa, and I think you could argue this globally, we are suffering a trust crisis. There's a growing gap in the trust that people feel that they have for their governments. There's a growing gap in the trust that people have with business. And I would also say that there's a growing gap in the trust that we have between each other, people to people. And there is so much that we can clearly learn from the social economy, which is functioning and has as a fundamental philosophy trust. What does trust look like? Well, it's quite simply a very, very strong sense of individual and organizational accountability. We do good and people see that, that's, that's fine. But most importantly, we are clear about what we do and how we do it. And what I say is what I do. For us as policymakers, this is profound. Because policymakers tend to want to enable an ecosystem by legislating and regulating it. And clearly, that's not going to get us anywhere, because people just choose not to engage in the system. So if we truly want to enable the social economy in South Africa, what we need to do is focus our attention not on regulation, but instead on what is it that we can do to enable trust networks? What is it that we can do to strengthen trust at community level? My fourth insight is very much one that I've been very, very guilty of. I've started many talks on social entrepreneurship on the negative need of now. 
those facts and figures that we are bombarded with daily, our unemployment rate, our inability to transition young people into employment, our inequality, so eloquently captured in Johnny Miller's photographs. But I've realized that this is a completely lazy argument to make, because if we truly want to achieve inclusivity and recognize what social change is, we cannot continue to be stuck in the present, and we must look forward. We have to look to the future. And so we started every talk on where do you want South Africa to be in 2050? Where do you want South Africa to be in 2050? It's 30 years. The academics tell us 30 years is one generation's time. And I can tell you that in one generation's time, South Africa is a country that is rich with opportunity, we are a country where everybody has access to fantastic education opportunities, irrespective of where they live and irrespective of where they grow up. We're a country that has a thriving community economy. We all buy local. And because we all buy local, we have dramatically lessened our reliance on imports. Our environment is pristine. Our water is clear and clean, and our air is good to breathe. We are a crime-free society. And we are a society that is leading the sixth industrial revolution, thanks to changes that were introduced in the early 2020s when free internet and data access was made available across the country. This is what our inclusive economy looks like. But it can be euphoric to look ahead. And so I would like to issue a caution which is that we cannot continue to look ahead if we don't guard our thinking by always recognizing that doing good is just not good enough. And we must always ask tough questions. I'd like to give you an example of this from our travels. This picture is taken in Kimberley, but there are plenty of these shops around cropping up across the country. As we traveled, we saw just how deep South Africa's water crisis is and how many people struggle to access good quality drinking water on a regular basis. And stepping into the breach are social enterprises, as I would completely expect them to do. This is textbook social enterprise, responding to a need in a community. But we must be careful, because doing good is not good enough. Access to water is a basic human right. And by attaching a price tag to a human right, we start commoditizing our rights. And this is a very, very dangerous space to be. We must always be mindful of the relationship between affordability and accessibility. The last few months have been particularly rich. We've learned a lot. We've learned exactly where to go and where we need to focus our attention if we want to achieve the what next. To know that we need to understand what the social economy looks like to ourselves as South Africans. What is our homegrown context? To know the importance and value of trust and recognize that we need to do work hard to strengthen it. To, to not always be focused on those negative needs of now, if we truly want to achieve and commit to social change. And to always remember to ask tough questions, knowing that doing good is not good enough. We've spoken to many people. We've had lots of feedback. And it is uplifting to have a path and a way forward. But there are days, there genuinely are days, when it feels like we're not achieving change when we feel that the change is not happening at the pace that we want it to happen, when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel bombarded by the negative. And so I would like to leave you with the most important question to ask on those days when it just feels that we're not going anywhere. And that question is to always keep asking, where do you want your country to be? In fact, where do you want your community to be? in one generation's time. Thank you.